Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks for getting warmed up. Remember, we have Pastor Jenkins in the house, so let's get it warmed up. All right. It's really not going to take me forever to talk to you about something that is eternal. I, I brought this with you, with me. I hope that you've gotten one of these through email or some of you uh, were even mailed this as uh, members of our church. And, and this is really in my heart what it's about. I, I, I think about this piece of ground and how years and years ago in 2002, the Lord spoke to, me, to my heart and he said, after two years of us having commercial real estate people looking for a piece of property and them coming up empty. And the Lord said, you've got to believe it before anybody else will. So make a banner. How many, how many remember 2002? Make a banner that says, possess the land. Put it over the door so everybody has to walk under it. You can't miss this vision. You actually have to walk under it to get in the house of God. And I preached that day about how God had given them manna from heaven. And the scripture would say that that was something that they nor their forefathers had known anything about. Nobody prayed. This is what I preached back then. Nobody prayed for manna because they didn't know it was possible. And I spoke to us, even though there wasn't a piece of land, we were running four services back to back in our small little building. We didn't even have a foyer, those of you who are enjoying this beautiful building. We didn't even have a foyer, we had a hallway. And after those services, we would say, we love you, but you got to go. And you would just shoo people out the door and bring in new people. Here we were without any possible piece of land after professionals looking for it. And we put that banner and we preached that message. If we will be faithful if we will do what God puts in our heart to do, and if we will be faithful to, to God, he will be faithful to us. And just as God brought manna from heaven with something they didn't know anything about, God has a piece of property we don't know anything about. Do you know what happened the next day? Nine o'clock in the morning, the very next day, there was a knock on my office door. Dave Valley, who used to be the catcher for the Mariners, said, hey, pastor, do you have a second? And I said, yeah, and he walked in the door. And he said, I have a friend of mine who's financially upside down and needs to sell a piece of property. I said, okay. I said, how big is it? He said, 20 acres. I said, oh. Instead of having great expectation, the minute he said that, I knew there was not 20 acres anywhere around here because somebody would have found it. I said, is it 10 miles out of town? Where is it? And as only a professional baseball player could say, he said, I could hit it with a nine iron from your office. I said, you got to be kidding me. I said, are you talking about that wetlands across the street? And he's like, no. And I said, okay, you better show me. We got in the car and we drove. And this was a private residence. And, and at that time, you couldn't even see on this land because there was a, a, a stand of timber all along the road. But when they widened the road, they hurt the roots. And so they had to start taking, after we bought the property, they had to start taking the trees out because they weigh 40,000 pounds and they were a risk because of them widening the road. But we pulled in here when you couldn't even see what was here. It was a hidden mystery. It was like manna from heaven that God brought nine o'clock the next morning. How about that? Only problem was, you know what the problem was? We didn't have any money yet. We didn't have any money. And one of the families on our board, they knew that this was a moment. You know, we were starting to raise money. I was going to cast vision and we we're going to start to raise money. We had no idea we would need it tomorrow. How crazy is that? And one of the families, they walked with us and they said, you know what? If the board and the, and the church desires this, we will, we will just buy the property. We'll, we'll put the money down. The church will own it, and you guys can, you know, pay us interest or whatever. And they took a step of faith. They took a leap of faith, and they helped us secure the land like that. This gentleman who owned the land told me, he said, you know, there's two couples that are down in the Dominican Republic vacationing right now, and they own horses. This was a horse ranch behind the tree line. And he said, they're talking about buying this property for their horses. And I said, hey, let's just decide on one thing right now. There's a lot of places around here you can ride horses, but there's, there's really no place you could build a church. So let's just establish this right now. This land is going to belong to God. And the church began to go to prayer. We, you know the story. We're on the wrong, we find out we're on the wrong side of the road. And we said, you know what? 
We just need to believe God because he's got manna. How many believe God still has manna? And here we are. We fought through. Thank you for that applause. Let me give you one more try on that. How many still believe that there's manna today that God has for us? I want to show you some slides. Let's just take a really quick look, okay? Groundbreaking. Remember that moment? Let's keep going. Ribbon cutting. All right, look what happened. The moment that we came onto this property, there was another miracle. You know what that miracle was? It was the miracle of opportunity. We were suddenly able to do things we were never able to do before. You know, people come from all over the country today to see this floor where you can take your chairs out and turn it into a banquet hall. And they're building churches all over with this kind of a floor. God just did things. He gave us opportunities. Keep going. Not only, you know, bringing us preaching opportunities. Keep it rolling, please. Concerts, you know, savor the season. How many women from our community over the years have come in and heard the gospel here? How about our children's ministry? Well, there's a drama. How about the drama that we've been able to do? Things we could have never done before. How about our kids? I mean, hundreds of kids coming. Our youth ministry. I mean, it's amazing. You know, when we came onto this property, we did not see addition. We saw multiplication by the hand of God. Not only just the people that are here, but the multiplication of opportunities and the ability to do things. We're a partner in our community like we never were. We host the Issaquah Food Bank and the Clothing Bank. We host the Issaquah School Foundations. Right here in this room, we help them be better than they could ever be without us. And they love our partnerships. The communities love this church. You go talk to people that are in the fire department, the police department. You talk to the people that are in public services. And they love this church because we give to this community. We, we bring our turkey giveaway. We have dental vans. We love the people. We give away backpacks. Is anybody with me tonight? And we're a place of hope. We do celebrate recovery. We, we, we tell people, God is not done with you. It's a time for a turning of a page, a new beginning. And I just want you to think through the pandemic, how many parents said to us, if it wasn't for our student ministry, we don't know where our kids would be. We don't know if it wasn't for our church where our kids would be. So I want to thank you tonight. I want to thank you for rising up. I want to thank you for being people of faith. I want, to take, I want to thank you for back in the day when we would say, let's pray, let's ask God, let's believe God to give us something great to do, not just something average to do. Let's dream big dreams. Let's believe God for a multiplying effect into our lives, into our families, and into our community. And God has answered that prayer. Look at us. We've been through a pandemic, but we're still here. We're still here. We're not done. Every week, there's more people coming through the doors. It used to be that you knew who was new to Eastridge. Well, we still know who's new to Eastridge because they walk in the front door and their head goes like this. You just, you just know because they're going, wow. Now you can tell who's come back after not having been here for a long time. Because their eyes are not up at the rafters or the wood or the timbers or the fireplaces. But it's those tears that you see in their eyes rolling down their cheek. Because they're being reminded of how good it is to be in the presence of a living God. How important it is to walk with this God. But you know something? We're also standing in this place of history. You know this. You know it better than I do. People shifting and moving. It's not just the people that moved out of the community. In far too many cases, people have moved out of their homes. And they've so much divorce and brokenness and heartache and pain in our community. It's staggering. I believe that the greatest days are right ahead of us that we have ever seen. And that this is not a time for us to pull off the side of the road. It's not a time to pause. It's not a time to quit. It's a time to seek even deeper. And yet at the same time, we had plans for phase two. You want to throw some of the phase two photos up real quick? We're a people of vision. 2019, this church popping at the seams, not enough room for anything around here. And so we knew 
our greater future demands a greater, a greater facility. So we started developing these plans for a phase two right over here. But you know something? When you go through something like the pandemic, you can't go through something like the pandemic and act as if nothing has happened. Our lives were shifted. Our lives were changed. The time frames were, sh- were changed. And we just know the future's great. But we need to be in sequence with where God is right now. And we even have people asking us, is it possible to do a school? And we're like, it's possible, but we want to make sure it's the right thing and not just an urgent thing. Does that make sense? And so we need time to discern and to, to grow the vision. And, and there's other people who have said, you know what, I could get behind it if I saw every chair filled in the building. You know what, visionaries, we don't get the chance as, as people of faith and, and visionaries, we don't get the chance to wait till it's all in front of us. We've got to move towards it or we'll never see it. And so that's why myself and our board have felt so strongly that this is not a time to pause. We need to sow. We need to sow. In order, in order to reap, we have to sow. And I just think about this. When we moved into this property, we were, we, had, we were way over our head. That's the honest truth. We were way over our head. Because our financial plan was we were going to take pledges. We needed $14 million for the bank to say, go build that building. So you guys pledged 15.5. How about that? And then you gave $750,000 right on the barrel head. And the bank said, wow, that is a church with commitment. You've got the pledges. You've got the cash. But secondly, we had our previous building. And we even had offers on that building. But you know what nobody saw coming? The recession of 20, eight, 20, uh, 2008 and 2009. And all of a sudden, people weren't able to meet those pledges. Some people had to move. Their jobs shifted. That building that they had given us offers on, the offers were pulled off the table. The value went from that time, six, six million or so, whatever, and uh, it went down to where people were coming back to us saying, hey, we'll give you 2.5 million. And I said, and we were, we, were cru- we were tight. We were so tight. We were over our head because we had a structural engineering problem. Cost escalated on us. We had a Christian uh, contractor, and they said, hey, look, when it's all built, we will make this right for you. You don't have to worry about it. And then when we got done, they said, sue us. And so we had more expense. Are you still with me? And we shouldered those things. Sometimes as Christians, you have to shoulder the heavier weight. We shouldered it, and we believed God. And we kept sowing to missions, and we kept helping other people. We gave to other churches. And you know what God did? We were never late on one payment, and God brought us through. And do you know where we are now, just 11 years into this thing? We're on the cusp of being able to pay off. It's not going to be casual. It's not going to be, it's not going to be just the crumbs off our table. It's, it's going to take heartfelt commitment and dedication to this vision, but we can get this done. We've said we'd like to do it in two years, but we've also said it'd be even better to do it in one. How many believe that? And, and, and you might even ask the why. Why do it? Why pay it off? What, you know, we're, we're paying our bills. We're strong. Why, why bother paying it off? Because we are living in a day of great uncertainty. We don't know what the end of this day is going to mean. Isn't that true? And listen, there have been churches the last two years or so that have been sold around the country, doors that have been closed. And I'm just saying to you, we have not come this far to be, to be vulnerable, susceptible. We've come this far to be unmovable. We've come this far to stand, and no matter what happens. You know, legacy, one of the most important things about legacy is not just to build a legacy. You've got to be able to sustain a legacy. Even with, you know, having a vision. My job is not just to be a visionary to get us where we are right now. My job is to be a visionary to get us to the next open door that God has. Anybody still with me today? So I've got, I've got to look at 
How do we build? How do we bring young leaders? How do we, how do we sustain and build on the victory that God has given us? And I want you to think about the next generation for a moment. Can you imagine handing the next generation a mortgage that at one point was $23.5 million versus handing the next generation a campus? And I'm not talking about just leaving the next generation. I'm talking about legacy toward them. Does that make sense? But how many of you think giving that opportunity of debt-free is an unbelievable gift to navigate what's next. So some people say, what's our vision? Our vision is to do what we've been doing and do it deeper and stronger. We've already got one of the great churches in the Northwest. We have some of the greatest people that you're ever going to meet. Look at them. They're right across their table. Just give them a little, thank you for being here. You are a champion. But you know something? We have, the, we have the foundation for God to use us in great ways. Commitment to the Word of God. Commitment to the presence of God. Commitment to stewardship. Commitment to our children. Commitment to our marriages. Not just ours, but in the community. Commitment to your students. Commitment to family builders. We're, we're committed with our East Ridge Leadership School to raise up the next pastors, missionaries, We've sent them to the world. We got to send even more. How many know that? And business leaders. Man, has God blessed your life since you've been in this church? Has God changed your financial status since you've been in this church? I hear it from so many people. Our lives are totally different. Our future, our kids are in different places because we learn to be honoring to God. We learn to put God first and we're different. So God's going to raise you up. He's not done. He's going to raise up CEOs and leaders and business owners. Because to do the work of of God, it, it demands not only resource, it demands godly people leading the way. So Eastridge, I'm out of time. I'm a minute 32 over. So I'm just saying this to you. The vision is great. The future is amazing. We, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be handed to us. But if you and I will dare to believe God, I can guarantee you this. You will never be sorry that you gave God your very best. When you get to heaven, you will never regret, Lord, I gave too much. You're not going to be standing in heaven going, God, I've missed it. I gave too much. I think you're going to be happy that you were faithful in a critical moment of human history that God allowed you to live in. I love you. I appreciate you. And I challenge you. Join the mission. Come on. You know, last night we took some time to share some stories and we thought it'd be appropriate to take some time to share them with our whole church family today because we believe that God is writing an amazing story through his church. Amen. You know, you may not know this, but the story of East Ridge Church started 58 years ago with three families who came together with a vision in a little dairy town called Issaquah to plant a church. Those three families started meeting together, doing Bible study and worship, and there would be an opportunity for them to build a campus, a church building. And that church actually sits right across the road from where we sit today. It's a Montessori school. In fact, every time you drive down the street and you pass that Montessori school, you're driving past a piece of our story. And as that church would begin to grow and they would begin to experience opportunity, how many of you know there came a familiar problem? They needed more space. And so they started to pray together about what God would have them do next. And they would actually build what we now call Eastridge Christian Assembly, which formerly was our student center, Kitty Corner across the street. I remember that building well because in 1999, Pastor Steve and Cheryl would come to be the senior pastors of that church with the green carpet, the green chairs, the basketball hoops that would fold out of the wall. But as you just heard from Pastor Steve, there would be amazing miracles and stories that would happen in that church building as we would see service after service full to where we got to another place where we needed more space. 
And God would open up an amazing miracle journey of us purchasing this piece of property, going through a recession, God building this, this campus, even when everybody around us said it was impossible. How many of you know we serve a miracle working God? And here's what's so amazing about this today, church. God is still writing his story through Eastridge. In fact, we believe the greatest chapters are still yet to be written, but they're stories that are being written through your lives. The miracles, the answers to prayer, the things that God is doing in your home and through your family. We believe that he's writing an amazing chapter right now. So I'm gonna invite you to stand up on your feet with us for just a few moments as we share some stories of what God is doing and we celebrate what God is, is writing, the chapter God is writing in this house of East Ridge Church. So would you sing with us this morning? This is a house of worship and this is a place of praise Where every demon trembles Where we proclaim your name And this is a house of healing And our hearts are full of full attention and you have the final say so come alive in the name of Jesus come alive in the name of Jesus this is a house of miracles and we bring everything to the feet of Jesus, everything in the name of Jesus. This is a house of miracles. Yeah. Oh, oh. Yeah. And this is a house of Church, I want to tell you the story of Katie Matthews. Would you welcome Katie as she comes this morning? You see, Katie, just weeks after her 16th birthday, would be in a tragic car accident that would leave her mostly paralyzed. And in the weeks and months that would come after, she would have to grapple with this newfound reality. She began to feel an incredible sense of bitterness and anger towards God. How could a good God allow something like this to happen? And as she would be overwhelmed and her heart would be heavy with this newfound reality, Katie would move to the Northwest where she would find herself walking through the doors of Eastridge Church. And it was here at Eastridge that God would begin to do a miracle in Katie's heart, where he began to soften her, begin to pour out his love and his grace and his mercy in her life. They would begin to change how she sees her circumstance. 
And all of a sudden she would begin to see purpose in the midst of her pain, that there would be meaning in the midst of her story. And now Katie is someone who is leading others into the hope of Jesus Christ through her life. Just even a few weeks ago, there was a story that was shared with us because every week Katie will roll her way to the front of the church and she'll sit at the very front during worship, even with her assistant dog, and, and she will turn her heart to the Lord. And there was someone who shared with us every single week that they had struggled to enter into worship, even with the, the sign of lifting their hands in worship, it just had never clicked for them. But they said, you know, one week I was standing behind a young woman who was sitting in a wheelchair and I watched her lift her hands to God in worship. And it struck me that if she can lift her hands and praise God in the midst of her situation, I can lift my hands and worship God. And together today, church, we need to realize that He is still moving. He is working all things together for good. So can we give God a shout of praise today for the story that He's writing through, Katie? Come on, let's lift our voice together. Would you welcome Will Davidson out to share his story with us? Will's an amazing young man in our youth ministry, but Will was born into a broken home, into a home where his mother struggled with addiction to the point where she knew that she could not provide the safe and secure environment that she knew her son would need. So at the age of four, Will was adopted by his grandmother, Marita. Marita, would raise Will in the house of God. Every week, bringing him to our kids' ministry, and Will would grow up here at East Ridge Church. And as Will was transitioning from elementary into middle school, there was a tragic piece of news that came, that his mother, who had struggled with addiction, had lost her life. In fact, it was Will's first week coming to youth church as I met him in the lobby, introduced myself. I said, hey, what's your name? He said, my name's Will. I said, Will, what's going on? How are you, what's new? He said, well, I just found out my mom died. And that was how I met Will. And over the last few months, we've been growing in relationship. Will's been plugged in here at Easter Youth. In fact, this last summer at our summer camp experience, Will said, I experienced God in a way like I've never experienced him before. I began to feel peace and hope and healing in my heart. In fact, you probably might remember Will because a few weeks ago, he was baptized on a Sunday morning in our service. And if you show up on a Tuesday night to youth church, there's no one in the building with a bigger smile than Will Davidson, full of joy and hope because he has found a family here at East Ridge Church that has brought hope into his life. So let's give God some praise this morning that he is still a miracle worker. Got time for one more? Hey, would you welcome Ron and Kathy Brown as they come this morning? Many of you know Ron and Kathy because they're such a, a huge part of our church family, but Ron's journey is a, is a story of addiction that culminated with him even living underneath a bridge in Lebanon, Oregon, homeless for over a year. But how many of you know, even in our darkest moments, God still sees us? You see, God will open an amazing door for Ron to go through a program called Teen Challenge. It would be in Teen Challenge that Ron would not only find sobriety, but more importantly, he would find Jesus. His life was radically changed. And through that process of graduating from that rehabilitation program, Ron would find an open door and an opportunity to join a facilities team at a church called Eastridge and now has been serving on our team for a number of years. In fact, most of the time when you walk through the doors and you sit down, that's a chair that Ron has helped set up for you. Come on, somebody. Yeah. 
And Kathy has had her own journey. You see, when Kathy moved here to the Northwest, she was struggling to find a church home and her daughter was invited to Eastridge Youth. And her daughter, through getting plugged in here at Eastridge, invited Kathy and the rest of their family to start attending Eastridge. But after only a few short weeks of being a part of our family here, they were on a, a family trip together and Kathy's husband tragically died while they were on that trip. She found herself having to raise her children as a single mom. But it was through the, the strength and stability, the family that she found here at Eastridge, that God began to walk her through a process of restoration and healing. And Eastridge not only was the place where both Ron and Kathy would find incredible grace and healing for their stories, but it was also the place where they would find each other. You see, not too long ago, Ron and Kathy stood on this exact same stage and they exchanged vows. And not only was it a sign and symbol of their love that they would profess to one another, but it was a sign and symbol of the redemptive power of God to bring second chances into our lives. Church, we believe that God is still writing His story today. So I invite you all across this room, begin to lift your hands with us because we believe the greatest days are still ahead. Come on, let's begin to sing together. I still believe your speech. So glad to have all of you today sharing your messages and sharing your testimonies. Wow, so good to be in the house of the Lord today. And I'm just gonna invite you to stay standing for just a moment because we wanna just again thank Pastor Jenkins and First Lady Trina for coming and being with us. They have come and just poured their hearts out at our Inspire Conference. So would you give Pastor Jenkins the best Eastridge welcome we could ever give as this great champion comes to preach the word. Thank you for being here, my friend. Bless you. Wow, thank you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for what you're doing at this place. This is a house of miracles. We bless you for your power and might that flows through the people and the lives and the ministry of the East Ridge Church. We pray that you bless our time together this evening for these next few moments. Allow your name to get all of the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You can be seated. I'm going to be honest. I'm always honest. But if they had told me that that's what they were going to do before I came, I wouldn't have accepted this engagement to come and preach. <laughs> you've heard the stories. You've heard and seen and you know. And God is certainly moving in this place. And uh, I want to take a moment and celebrate the leadership of your pastor, Steve, and the real pastor, Cheryl uh, Jameson. <laughs> Help me celebrate them tonight. Yeah, I, I've been coming to this church for a long time uh, when Pastor Steve and Cheryl first got called to this church, and uh, it's been a joy. It's been a, a blessing to cultivate a relationship with my brother from another mother. That's what I say about him, uh, and our friendship over the years has been incredible, and if more 
African Americans and Anglos across this country cultivated the kind of relationship that Brother Steve and I have, and Cheryl and my wife Trina, this world would be a much better place than it is today. So I'm honored to be able to call him my friend and my brother, and I'm honored to be with you here tonight. Um, I want to I want to uh, talk to you from Second Corinthians chapter eight. If you have your your Bibles or your phone or your iPad or your tablet or whatever you have, most people don't bring stuff like that to banquets. But I want to just spend a few moments and walk through these first five verses of Second Corinthians chapter eight. Oh, my wife is here. My bride of forty. 42 years come August. Some of y'all know we got six kids and we have six grandkids and a seventh on the way. There's nothing like grandparenting. It's a joy. You get to hug the kids, laugh with them, and send them jokers home. Come on, somebody, say amen. Um, and this, uh, one other thing I want to say, uh, looking at the videos and the pictures from the history and how this church has transitioned and what all has happened, it's just a joy to see. And uh, thank God for what he's doing in this midst. I hope y'all recognize y'all are in a good place. Look at your neighbor say, this is a good place. That was too weak. Y'all are too weak. You need to have a little more spunk behind that. Say, this is a good place. Yeah. yeah. A lot of churches that are not doing what y'all are doing and not impacting lives and not changing lives. A lot of churches are closing down, but y'all are still alive and vibrant and fresh. And I'm so honored to uh, be able to be here with you today. I want to talk from 2 Corinthians chapter 8. The Apostle Paul writes this letter to this troubled church. It's a troubled church. They got a lot of stuff going on in it. A lot of drama, but it is still impacting lives. It is still making a difference, but it's got a lot of stuff going on. So he writes uh, this epistle, this letter to them. And this is the second letter that he sends to them. Uh, he sent the first letter that he seeks to spell out all the stuff that he, he knows going on in the church and try to straighten them jokers out. Because y'all do know the church, we're not here because we're perfect. We're not here because we've arrived. Sometimes people have an expectation when you come to church that church people are going to somehow be different than the world. But the truth of the matter is we are just as jacked up as the world, just forgiven. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, I've been forgiven. I'm a work in progress. God's working on me. God's trying to get us straight. Don't come to the church and expect perfection. If the church was perfect, look at your neighbor, say these words with me. If the church was perfect, come on, y'all, help me. Just, help, just play along with me for a moment here, okay? If the church was perfect, it became imperfect when you joined. Go ahead, tell them. Yeah, it's not. It's not perfect. It's got its issues and its challenges. But Paul is writing to the church to try to straighten out their drama in, uh, in the first letter that he wrote to the Corinthian church. But by the time he gets to the second letter, they have improved. They're getting better. And he's beginning to teach and talk to them about some things. And by the time we get to chapter 8, he wants to dialogue with them. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. This is a church... Uh, that he uh, wants to encourage them to make some choices and some decisions. And he says to them in chapter 8, moreover, somebody say moreover. That means, uh, let me add to what I've already talked to you about. He talked to them about a number of things that leads up to it. And the previous chapters, he's talking to them about living holy and living righteously. And making choices and decisions that are a reflection of righteous living. And by the time he gets to chapter 8, he says, Moreover, verse 1, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Y'all see that right there? So, so he says, listen, I, 
I, I want to let you know about the churches in Macedonia. Macedonia is a church not far away. They are a struggling church, poor, poor, destitute church. And he says, I want to talk to you about something specific about this church. I want to talk to you about the grace that God has bestowed upon them. God smeared them with some grace. Now, I love talking about grace because I recognize that grace is a very significant, very important part of life. Grace is God's empowering presence. It is when God influences your heart to do the right things, make the right choices. When God gives you grace, he not only empowers you to do the right thing, he gives you the desire to want to do the right things. That's what grace is. It's when God gives you the desire to want to do right. Now, I don't know how y'all feel about it, but I need grace. I need grace and have had the grace of God smeared in my life, and I'm grateful for it. Grace helps me to be a better pastor. Grace helps me to preach to white people who don't say amen while I'm preaching. <laughs> Come on, look at your neighbor and say, you need grace to preach to you people. When I'm at my church, they be saying, preach on, pastor. I like that. I need grace to love my wife, raise my kids, raise my grandkids. I need grace because sometimes my wife says things and does things that I just don't understand. <laughs> Come on, brothers, don't leave me out here by myself. <laughs> Thank you. Is that you who said that? Who said that? You? Is your wife with you? Oh, you a bold man. I'm proud of you, bro. Thank you, man. Yeah, I need grace. I need grace to pass the people. I need grace. I need God to smear me with the presence, the desire, and the want to to lead people, and that's what grace does. Grace helps you want to do the right thing when you don't want to do the right thing. Grace not only gives you the want to, he gives you the ability to. And he says to the church in Corinth, let me tell you about the grace that's been smeared on the churches in Macedonia. It's an amazing thing Paul is saying to them. It's something you need to know about, Corinth. You need to know about the grace God put on the churches in Macedonia. And he says, look at this, verse 2, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. I love that, what he's trying to say to them. He's saying to them, here's what condition these people are in. They have, number one, verse 2, they have great trial of affliction. These people are struggling. And they got great trials and afflictions. But not only do they have that, it says in verse 2, they have deep poverty. These people are having tri trials and deep poverty. And as I look around this room, y'all look pretty good. <laughs> Don't none of y'all look like y'all in any deep poverty in here. <laughs> this church, these Macedonian churches were poor people. They were poor. They didn't have riches. They didn't have a lot of money flowing out of their pockets. They were poor, struggling, deep poverty, the scripture says. But here's what I love about this. In, in between their great trial and their deep poverty, they had the abundance of joy. Do y'all see that in verse number two? In between trials of affliction, great trials of affliction, and deep poverty, they had the abundance of joy. That's, that's, some, that's profound. It's amazing. The here, here's what they had. And, 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 the, and the thing that has blessed and encouraged me, how were they able to have such joy in the midst of affliction and in the midst of poverty? How were they able to have such joy? I'm glad you asked the question. <laughs> they have four things that they make commitments to. And that's why I want to spend the next few moments, the next 19 minutes and 42 seconds that I have. <laughs> Here's what they had. Here's why they were able to do that. Here's what brought them to a place of joy in the midst of affliction and in the midst of deep poverty. He says they abounded, verse 2, the latter part of verse 2, they abounded in the riches of their liberality. They made a commitment to be liberal with their resources. But there's something about liberality that these people in Macedonia had 
they were willing to be liberal in their giving and because of their liberality, God gave them great joy. Thank both of y'all for that applause. I appreciate it. Yeah, and it's great. God has given us the secret of what caused these people to have such a joy in the midst of all of the hell that they were going through, their great afflictions and their, and their uh, 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 deep poverty. Thank, thank you. <laughs> they had great joy. Why? Because they were abundant with their liberal giving. They were willing to take what they had and give it. They gave abundance. You see, they understood that something that a lot of people don't quite understand. What they understood is that if you want to reap a harvest, you have to sow. We live in a culture that does not want to sow. They want to reap without sowing. They want to give a little bit and get a whole lot back. That's not how it works. No farmer goes down and expect a harvest in a field he has not planted. Go on and preach, Pastor Jenkins. Why are you expecting a harvest and you haven't planted anything? You haven't given anything. That's why people will, will go down. Do y'all have lotteries here? Look at them acting like they don't know that there's a lottery here. <laughs> some of y'all be down there. Y'all, you know, I know some of y'all down there in line playing those numbers. I know you are. People want a big reward with no harvest, but that's not how the kingdom works. You reap what you sow. And you reap in proportion to how you sow. If you give a little, you get a little. If you give a lot, God can bless you with a lot. If you want a reward from God, learn how to sow. These people in Macedonia had great joy. And here's what I love about God. Sometimes when God rewards you, he rewards you with stuff that money can't buy. Come on, somebody, holler at me for just a second. There's some things in my life that money can't get for me. But I know that if I honor God and love God and serve God and obedient to God and give to his kingdom and advance his kingdom and do what's pleasing in his sight, he has the capacity and the ability to step into the domain of my circumstances and shift my situation and turn things around and cause miracles to happen and give me things that money can't buy. But they were liberal. They understood the significance of their giving. But not only that, in verse 3 it says this, I'm almost finished. I waited for somebody to say, take your time, but y'all didn't. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's too late to say it now. It says in verse 3, he says, for I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability. Do y'all see that? They, 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 whew, they not only were a people that gave abundantly, they gave beyond their ability. They gave beyond what they could afford. See, a lot of times people try to figure out what can I afford? Sometimes when you are people of faith, you gotta learn how to give beyond what you feel you can afford. And trust, trust and believe that God will work it out. They gave beyond their ability. I love that. It blesses me. It gives me faith and courage that they gave in a way that they could not afford to give. If you try to only give within the parameters of what you can afford, you might not be able to ever feel like you can afford anything. I remember when I had my first child, then I had my second child. I got six kids. Uh, let me take that back. That's not true. I ain't had no kids. My wife had the six kids. <laughs> I'm up here talking about, you know, that I had kids. I ain't had no kids. <laughs> but I remember thinking when the second child came and the third child came and the third, third child came and the fourth child came that I couldn't afford it. I guess I should have been thinking about that when I was doing what I did. But sometimes your flesh just don't listen to reason. Can I get a help from somebody here? Do anybody here know what I'm talking about right here? Yeah. 
but what I've learned through my six kids is that even though I never felt I could afford it, God always made a way. None of my kids ever went to bed hungry at night. None of them were, didn't. They all had clothes to wear. God always somehow made a way. He made provisions. He made a way. Even though I felt I couldn't afford it, God always made a way. And what I love about these people in Macedonia is they gave beyond what they had the ability to give. And somehow or another by them giving, and here's what the Macedonia church did, they gave to help other poor people, other people who were struggling. They, they gave to help the kingdom move forward. They gave. And God blessed them. And Paul says, let me tell you about these people. They got smeared with grace and they were able to do some, some spectacular things. And I'm grateful because they gave beyond their ability. There's somebody sitting in this room today who feel like there's a number you want to give, but you feel like you can't afford it. I dare you to give God a try and say, God, if you make it available, if you put it through my hands, if you put it in my hands, I'll give it to your kingdom. Preach on, Pastor Jenkins. I have to encourage myself while I'm preaching up here today. I want to challenge you today to go beyond what you think you can do. And have the faith to believe that somehow if God puts it in my hands, I won't spend it on myself, but I'll use it to advance the kingdom of the almighty God that we serve. Y'all see how the claps are getting lower and lower and lower. <laughs> they gave beyond their ability. I love that verse right there. I bear witness to their ability, and yes, beyond their ability. But hold up, that's not all. He says right here in verse 3, here's the third thing. He says, they were freely willing. Jot that down. Somebody say they gave willingly. They were not, they didn't have an attitude about it. They didn't do it reluctantly. They willingly gave. And, 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 and matter of fact, here was verse, verse 4 says, verse 3 says they were freely willing, and it says in verse 4, imploring us with much urgency that we should receive the gift. It means that they, was, they were anxious. Take this money! <laughs> y'all can't even imagine that, can y'all? <laughs> you will take this money. Take it now! In Jesus' name, take this money. They begged them, they implored them, they, 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 they said, you got to take it. Because you know what they understood? Their miracle in their life was dependent on them being able to sow. They understood that. They understood something that we don't understand in America. They understood that it is significant that you plant a seed. If you want to reap a harvest, you got to plant a seed. And they said to them, take this money. Take this money and shove it. Take this money. <laughs> It's right here in the text. Put, put the verse back up on the screen real quick. <laughs> Imploring us, begging us, he's saying, with much urgency that we should receive the gift. That we should take it. That should be our attitude. We should be running up to the altar to give our money to the kingdom of God. And we believe in the God that we save as a, believe as a miracle worker and a problem solver and a prayer answerer. If we believe in that, we should be running to the altar. <laughs> With urgency they did it. Here these poor people who had their own drama and their own affliction, they were rushing and begging to take the money. Whew. Oh, it changed my heart and my mind about it. God has smeared this church. He saw what their attitude was. I'm almost finished. <laughs> smeared them with grace he rubbed them anointed them with grace I need grace I need the grace of God and that's what he did God gave them grace and let me close
<laughs> Tell me more. <laughs> They had a willing attitude. They gave beyond their ability. They gave abundantly. And the reason they could do that is verse five. He says, and not only has we had hoped but they first gave themselves to the Lord. You, you see, the reason that they were capable of giving their money is because they had given themselves. People can't give their money if they haven't given themselves to Jesus. They, they, they surrendered their hearts their minds, their lives to the kingdom. Too many of our churches have people with one foot in the church and one foot in the world. We're straddling the fence. Elijah said on one occasion, how long will you be halted between two opinions? How long are you going to let the world guide you and also try to listen to the, to the Lord? No man can serve two masters. You have to make up in your mind who's going to be your God. And, and, and I'm, I'm 63. <laughs> you know, when you get old, you have to think about these things. <laughs> Is there anybody here like me who go into a room and forget why you went into the room? Thank you. I have to think about how old I am. Because I forget, and I'm 63. 63, I'll be 64. October 11th, write that down. Send me, send me a, a, a text, an email. Uh, and in my 63 years of living and life, my 63 years of life, I've had a lot of journeys, a lot of experiences, but I am persuaded that I can trust God to give him my whole self. I trust him. I've seen him answer prayers. I've seen him work miracles. I've seen him open up doors. I've seen him work miracles on my behalf. I've seen God answer my prayers. You know, it's great to serve a God that you see him answer prayer. You know what I see God do? I've seen God answer a prayer even before I asked him. I've seen him open up doors and do things for me that I never dreamed would happen. I've extended and gone well beyond what I ever dreamed or imagined uh, would ever happen in my life. And I know it's because I have given him my whole self. I don't know who I'm preaching to today, or who you are, but if you haven't given yourself to the Lord like these Macedonians did, if you haven't given yourself, your whole self, your whole being of who you are to him, it will be difficult for you to give him a dime. I'm struggling with people who are still wrestling with tithing. That's, that's like elementary school. That's like the first grade, and you still wrestling with giving God 10%. Yeah, no, no, that's, and, and then some people think they really did something big that they gave Jesus 10%. The song don't say 10, I give 10% to Jesus, it says I gave him my all. I surrender. One-tenth to Jesus. I surrender. One-tenth, one-tenth to Jesus. I, that ain't what the song, that is not what the song says. It says, I surrender all to him. And guess what? He's worthy of having everything that I have. He's worthy of me giving him my whole heart and my whole mind and my whole soul and my whole being. The miracles of war that he's wrought, the prayers that he's answered, the doors that he's opened, the fact that he's forgiven me of all of my sins and made a way for me to have provisions in heaven. I will give him my all. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. My question to you today, what, what is it? 
Is it, is it all? One-tenth or less than? My challenge to you today is get the grace of God and be like the Macedonians.